I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, March 15th. Tonight we'll be discussing jet stream roller winds, surface level pressure, significant wave heights, and all the things that go into making surf in the North Pacific Ocean. Let's get to work. Looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean, we see a little bit of a gale pushing off the Kuril Islands with like 33 foot seas, but most energy all aimed north. And other than that, a pretty weak pattern over the North Pacific Ocean. Let's start digging into the details. As usual, we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales and when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, just like here, a dip in the jet going south. That helps promote a counterclockwise flow aloft in the upper levels of the atmosphere and also down at the surface. And a counterclockwise flow in the northern hemisphere is a sign of low pressure. Low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates wind. Winds generate seas. Seas as they radiate away from the fetch area turn into swell. Swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. All right, so we have a reasonably decent trough here over the Kuril Islands being fed by, what's that, about 150, maybe 160 knot winds. Most of the winds here are over on the southeast quadrant of this trough. You really want the uh, winds more back here. That, that would push winds out of the north. Remember, counterclockwise flow, and that's what generates swell aimed at either Hawaii or the U.S. west coast. But if all the fetch and all the energy is in the southeast quadrant of the gale, then that only targets the Aleutians and maybe uh, maybe up into Alaska. So not an ideal looking situation. Then from there, the jet splits with the northern branch ridging way north into Alaska, and the northern branch is the one that has all the action. Southern branch here, meanders along, actually splits again with remnant energy pushing over Hawaii and then eventually into Baja. But it's when you get this split pattern between the splits, you get high pressure like right in there. And that has been the hallmark of uh, the, basically the whole winter season, at least since maybe the end of January. The jet just started splitting and there has literally all storm activity has been confined to the far west Pacific, nothing in the east of any magnitude. Now, do note here, there is what we call a backdoor trough right here. Now, it's not doing anything to generate surf, but it is creating a surface low here, and that is producing, thank goodness, some rainfall that's moving into California, snow in the Sierra. Uh, unfortunately, for skiing-wise, many of the resorts, if not all of them, are closed due to coronavirus issues. So uh, your best shot is hiking. Earn your turns, uh, but definitely beware of avalanche danger. All right, let's move on. So giving, moving into Monday, the trough continues. Nothing particularly uh, 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 remarkable uh, uh, in the West Pacific. And the split pattern continues with the backdoor trough off of California. Then we get into Tuesday, and the trough sort of gets reinvigorated a little bit. Still, 150 knot winds pushing off uh, Japan. Trough continuing there, and does okay into about Thursday. And then it looks like the jet is even going to start splitting further to the west, like 150, just off the coast of Japan here. That isn't good. And there you can see just this massive split pattern over almost all the Pacific, indicative of high pressure, just not looking favorable. We need massive amounts of energy in the jet. The way you'd get that is with the active phase of the MJO. The MJO has been exceedingly weak. So there's just been literally, whoops, we went too far. There we go. And there we are 180 hours out on uh, Sunday night a week from now. And the jet just looking weaker and weaker. It honestly looks like we're transitioning already to a summertime pattern. And that's kind of sad seeing how we're only halfway into March. Basically, we had one month of winter, at least in California, and that's been it. 
All right, let's take a look at surface level pressure, surface level winds, and as we expected, there is a low pressure system over the northern Kuril Islands with winds at 40, maybe 45 knots right there. But notice the really core part of the fetch is right in here, the southwest quadrant of the storm. That's where you get northwest winds that would target Hawaii or California. And it's mainly landlocked, half of it's landlocked, so that limits your... Uh, your swell generation potential, all the unlandlocked fetch is aimed north into the Bering Sea, and that doesn't do anything for anyone. All right, so we that system fades out as we get into Monday, but a new system is forecast uh, forming, being fed by the jet stream with 50-knot winds. I thought, nah, there's a little tiny sliver of 55-knot winds. And there we go, into Monday night, good solid area, 50, 55-knot winds. That should generate some decent seas and aimed well at Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast, continuing into Tuesday morning and even into mid-Tuesday morning. So that's almost 24 hours of 55-knot winds. You get some decent seas out of that. Then the gale or the storm starts lifting northeast into Wednesday. Still fetch overexposed waters of the North Pacific Ocean. And then as we get later into Wednesday, it fa fades out. And then we know the jets start splitting. In fact, you can see evidence of there with high pressure starting to build the split point way over somewhere around in here. And then we'll roll this out. You can literally see whatever storm activity there is. It goes up the Kuril Islands, across the Aleutians, totally landlocked. There's a 1038 or 1040 millibar high forming in the Gulf of Alaska, just locking things down, not doing anything. And that, that's sort of the picture. Ah. Then we get another, remember that backdoor low, Sunday a week out. Maybe we'll get a little bit of repeat of uh, precipitation into California. We'll take what we can get. And that's sometimes what happens when you get this super split pattern where the jet is split way over here. It actually allows a trough to push down the U.S. West Coast, and you get these backdoor fronts. Now, they tend to not be super laden with moisture. It's the ones that come right off the Pacific, you know, the atmospheric river type systems. That's what generates heavy precipitation. But these tend to be a lot colder because they're dragging down uh, cold air from Alaska, and the net result is you get lighter snow, but a lot of it, and good quality for skiing. All right, let's move on. Let's take a look at the wave models. What is the effect of these winds on the ocean surface? So here we are, significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean, as expected. Little tiny area of 32, 32.8 foot seas off the northern Kuril Islands as of 18Z, that'd be 11 a.m. California time, of no real interest. It's the next system forming here off of Japan on later on Monday, starts getting some traction, seas bloom to 35 feet Monday night, and then pushing to 42 feet on Tuesday morning. They ramp up from there, that's 48 feet, and then fading a little bit down to 46 feet by Tuesday night. So sort of a, and then 40 feet, you, you, you can sort of read it for yourself. But decent amount of fetch, probably a real West Angle swell for Hawaii, and maybe unshattered energy even into uh, San Francisco from early uh, on in the system. And then that's that system fades out. And then we're looking for any seas of 30 feet or greater, and we're not really thinking we're going to see it, but we'll go through the motions here. And there you go. Looks like pretty much a slack pattern after that. But if you look south, and we're going back Sunday a week ago, a system did develop in the South Central Pacific. You can see it right here, up to a 40-foot seas over a tiny area and lifting a little bit to the northeast. Swell is in the water. This has produced a decent kind of south angled swell we'll say mainly for southern california but it's going to work its way up into northern california as well hitting hitting southern california i think it may be as early as this evening but mainly monday tuesday pretty much for the bulk of the work week by friday it'll be fading out and we'll roll this out just so you can see what's been going on down south here we are another system developed on Friday, a smaller system. This is Friday uh, two days ago. And there you go, with 41-foot seas again, not as large a fetch area, 
but lifting a little bit to the northeast and continuing into late Saturday, and then it faded out. So the thought is yet another swell will be behind the already uh, the, the southern hemi swell that's already in the water. So this might arrive, oh, we'll say, for the weekend. Not not uh, That'd be five days, six days from now, something like that. So nothing huge, but rideable just the same. Roll that out. All right, let's go take a look at the forecast now. Two swells in the water, and let's see if there's any hope for another. We're just looking for anything with decent-sized seas aimed to the northeast off of New Zealand, 28-foot seas. That might be good for Hawaii. This is, But that's Friday. That's five days from now, if it materialized. Actually, the models yesterday showed it being stronger than what it is. This system also was of some interest, but it's mainly moving off to the east. Maybe there'll be some background swell for Southern California from that. And then you roll it out, whoops, and then things get pretty quiet after that. So the bulk of the Southern Hemi swell is already in the water. Two of them, one arriving for the early part of the week, the next one arriving into California for the weekend. For Hawaii, Probably not so much. Maybe that that one that's forecast five days from now off of New Zealand might push some energy towards the South Shore, but nothing real obvious at this point in time. So then we go looking for wind swell, local wind conditions. Now, the interesting thing is trades pretty light for Hawaii, and here's the local low, and it's not, you see, it's not a well-organized low at all. It's got 20, maybe 25 knot winds, making some wind swell pushing into California. But, you know, what was it today? Waist high in Northern California, maybe some peaks at chest high at top spots. Pretty uninspiring, but you take what you can get, right? All right, so we get into Monday, same deal. Low continues off the coast. Trades southeast, not bad. 15 knots for Hawaii. Go into Tuesday. Uh, High pressure starts building. North winds looking, trying for California, but not there yet with the remnants of the low hanging off the coast. Southeast trades. See low pressure. There's a cutoff low relative to Hawaii. Not going to generate any swell. Just uh, increased. And they're not even really trades. They're low pressure generated winds, but they are from the same direction as trades. You get into Wednesday, still Light wind pattern for California. Same deal for Y, 20 knot southeast winds. Get into Thursday, the low starts moving inland, uh, but still light flow early for California. Same deal for Hawaii. Where are we? We're into Friday. Still no winds for California. This is kind of good. It's it's kind of unbelievable when you get this split jet. You notice most of the high pressure energy, it's actually retrograded instead of sitting right here, just driving... Uh, driving north winds into California. It's retrograded west into the northwestern Gulf. Light winds southeast for Hawaii. Get into Saturday. No real change until maybe Saturday afternoon. Northwest winds start building as high pressure builds. Here comes your classic springtime setup. At least it looks like it, but there you go. Another low that'll maybe hold off the high pressure. Trades for Hawaii, northwest winds Sunday morning, fading some as we get into Sunday evening. This looks like another precipitation generator for California. Let's go take a look. All right, so precipitation relative to California. You can see as of 0Z, that's 5 p.m., Rain pushing into central California, a little bit of northern California. Snow continuing heavy, and it's really focused on We'll say from about Yosemite northward into Tahoe, not so much there for Mammoth. That continues into the evening, into Monday, maybe the precipitation falls finally down into Mammoth and the central Sierra also targeting uh, Tahoe. Then we get into Tuesday, things start breaking up a little bit. Still light snow, we'll say. Cold temperatures should do okay. Wednesday, Things start evaporating. Yeah, scattered showers, maybe. And then Thursday, Friday, yeah, same sort of deal. We're waiting for the next low to show up here on the chart. Starting to organize right there. And you can see, eh, look at that, a little bit of snow as we get into Saturday night, uh, a week from now. And then Sunday, here comes the next low. And where are we? We're at 180 hours out. 
More rain come Sunday night, a week from now, if you believe the models, and snow for the Sierra. So here's a little bit of a zoomed in version, same thing. Uh, Tahoe, right in here. You can see the focus of the activity. This is the GFS model, 10 day run. Things sort of dry up as we get into Thursday and Friday. And let's look for the next system to organize. Here it comes. And there we go. Sunday, pretty good dump peak. That's 14.14 inches of snow. That's a uh, one inch equals 12 inches of snow. Uh, that is on 5 a.m. Monday and continuing. Pretty good dump, it looks like, even into Tuesday. Where are we? Still got a little bit more of this model, and then things dry out as we get into Wednesday. All right, so here's the real pity of everything right now. Finally, snow has arrived. It started, was it Saturday morning and Friday night, or was it Saturday morning? The, the company that runs Squaw, and there's like 15 other resorts associated, all in that bundle, they shut everything down because of COVID-19. At the same time, the so that's that's everybody on the Icon Pass. At the same time, everybody on the Epic Pass, all those other resorts, the same thing happened with that parent corporation, like Whistler and everyone, shut them all down. Uh, so basically, then the, the independents are like, okay, well, we're still going to run. Like uh, Mount Rose today was open, and then about two o'clock, they cave too. They said there's just, you know, there's too probably too much liability staying open, risking get people getting sick. So they shut down. Um, Homewood was another one that we saw was open this morning. Don't know their status of, as of right now. Just haven't looked. But finally, after I think the last meaningful snow we had was somewhere in uh, January 20th range, somewhere like that. And now almost eight weeks later, Hey, the storm door opens, big dump of snow. I mean, we're talking 36, and as of right now, I looked at the, the, the gauge off of uh, Sugar Bowl, and they had 36 inches of snow on their on their uh, snow stake or their boot cam or whatever you want to call it, plus another 36. So you're talking six feet of snow, and then next weekend, it looks like maybe another three feet on top of that. So finally, winter arrives, and everyone's shut down. I mean... The resorts, they're doing what they have to do. I understand it. I'm not criticizing at all, but it's got to be, not only is it painful for the skiers, but the resorts, I'm sure, are hurting financially. And now all of a sudden, okay, the floodgates open and they have to shut down. Just a horrible situation for everyone, the skiers and the businesses as well. And look at the snow levels, really low for this time of year. Here's the base of Squaw. It's just Nice cold temperatures for the next 10 days, the whole way to the bottom. And winds, look at that. No wind, really. I mean, couldn't it be a better powder setup? All right, let's go take a look at another resort. Kirkwood, basically mirror image, same deal. Lots of snow. What way the, the, uh, the snow level way below the base. Winds, light. Now, here's the interesting twist for Mammoth. So, Mammoth is further south. Remember, we said the, the snow line was somewhere around the Yosemite area, maybe a little bit north of there, obviously. So, Mammoth, only with a foot, I don't know how much actually fell, but another foot projected, and then maybe a foot after that, but exponentially smaller. Snow level's not an issue. This is the base of Mammoth here, so plenty cold enough. Winds, of course, not an issue either. All right, so let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the MJO and ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index? Again, the MJO is like a mini El Nino or La Nina with a three, four week period. It runs across the Pacific on the equator from west to east when in the active phase, it feeds energy to the jet stream and that in turn produces storms and storms, of course, produce surf and snow. And then when in the inactive phase, it sort of steals energy or, or doesn't push energy into the jet stream. You get that split pattern just like what we're seeing right now and have been seeing. Uh, and then, of course, El Nino, a longer range cycle that runs for a year or so in the, we'll call it the active state, the El Nino state. And then about it, and it does that about once every five to seven years, something like that. And then the rest of the time, not so great for storm production. All right, so first up, let's go examine the MJO. And what we're looking for is 
uh, westerly winds or westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. So what's that mean? Here's the West Pacific. Here's the East Pacific. Here's the equator. The international date line, the date line right down there, that is New Guinea. The Kelvin wave generation area is the area starting about 135 east from 5 north to 5 south out to about 170 west, same area. So you, in your mind, draw a box right there. And what that means is when you have the active phase of the MJO and it pushes over this area, and if it's strong enough, it'll produce west anomaly or out and out west winds. It'll take warm water that's here, push it off to the east under the equator, and that warm water, after about, it takes three months to travel across the Pacific, will then erupt off of Ecuador and form a warm pool. If you have successive strong active phases of the MJO, it will produce successive strong Kelvin waves that will then start building up warm water here in the West Pacific, and that is how you get El Nino started. So, and even lesser than that, just the active phase of the MJO, as we discussed earlier, pushes energy into the jet stream and feeds the storm track. So, we're very interested in the active phase of the MJO. All right, it's norm normally manifest you can see it on these charts by finding west winds. All right, so in the East Pacific, we have east winds, pretty strong, the arrows, not as big as they have been, and continuing over the Central Pacific, continuing into the Kelvin wave generation area. If anything, this looks like the inactive phase of the MJO, but that's just out and out winds. It's the winds, how do they compare today as compared to last year, the year before, and the year before that for this time of year? Okay, and looking at that, we say, yeah, these easterly winds are maybe a hair bit strong. You see a couple of arrows there pointing to the east, but we also see some from the west. So this is pretty much normal. We continue looking along, and here in the Kelvin Wave Generation area, yeah, there are east winds, but they're normal, not any stronger than usual, but there's no indications whatsoever of westerly anomalies. So this you know, this first little indicator we're looking at suggests no active phase of the MJO in play. No big surprise. We looked at the jet stream charts earlier. The jet stream's massively split and only supposed to get more split. So the going in thesis right now is we're in the inactive phase of the MJO. What have the winds been doing in the Kelvin wave generation area for the last five days? All right, so where are we? South America, Central America, Mexico. Where's the equator? Zero right there. Okay, there's New Guinea. Okay, Australia. So Kelvin wave generate. Oh, there's the date line right there. Okay, so Kelvin wave generation area, basically right in there. What we're looking for is oranges and arrows pointed from the west. That would be the active phase of the MJO. Not really seeing it. A little bit there, but also equal amounts of easterly anomalies here. That was on March 9th. Same deal on the 10th. Same deal on the 11th. Say, and it's only down to five south. You see that, but the, the equator is right on zero. So the box is like right in here. We're not seeing, keep going. We're not seeing anything that suggests that the active phase of the MJO has been in control the last five days. Let's go take a look at the forecast. All right, so here we go. Now, this is kind of a weird chart. It's the whole planet on one chart, but we know that the Pacific starts at about, we'll say 135 east, so right about here, you just draw a line right up there in your mind, and then goes to Ecuador is about at 180 west, so there, between there and there. The Kelvin wave generation area, that's what we're really interested in, is from there to there, so you just draw a line up there. Here's today, okay, so if you go in the past, back February, we see the oranges and reds, westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. That was our last active phase of the MJO. It's been slowly fading and fading. And as of today, we'd say any westerly anomalies are all but dead. And looking down, we see building the blues are easterly anomalies and get supposed to be pretty strong a week from now. So if anything, we were in the active phase, or at least a neutral phase, and it's only going to get worse from here, according to this model, at least for the next week. Let's take a look at phase diagram charts. This is a fancy way of being able to say exactly where the core of the active phase of the MJO is. I mean, if it's not over the Pacific, it's somewhere else, because it's, it's always there. 
Okay, so this chart tells you where it is and how strong it is. It's where the heavy dot is. So that's the heavy dot. So what are we doing looking at? Assume this is the North Pole. You're looking down on the North Pole. The MJO is only on the equator. Okay, and it travels from, well, you can see like, it's from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent. That's like Bali, that area. Okay, over to the West Pacific and then under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. It goes round and round. And wherever the active phase is, the inactive phase is pretty much 180 degrees or on the other side of the planet from it. All right. So right now, the active phase supposedly is in the West Pacific. But the closer to the circle you are, we're actually inside the circle, then it's considered to be extremely weak. And these are the different three different uh, members of, of potential forecasts. And they have the active phase staying exceedingly weak and maybe leaching into the Atlantic. And that's it. That, this, per the statistic model, the dynamic model, the GEFS, same deal, says it's very weak in the West Pacific and is supposed to build to moderate status 15 days from now and then kind of collapse somewhere in the Indian Ocean. So there's literally, according to both models, no hope for a strong active phase making it into the Pacific to somehow save or give us some hope for, for a resurgence of winter, you know, driven by the MJO, not happening according to these two models, at least for the next two weeks. Let's keep digging. That said, according to this, this is outgoing long wave radiation, fancy word for cloud cover. Okay, the active phase of the MJO is like low pressure, produces cloud cover. In terms of outgoing long wave radiation, blues, negative anomalies, that means more clouds, less sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface. So, according to this, the statistic model, yes, the active phase is in the West Pacific, and we saw that it is, and very weak and continuing to get weaker for the next 15 days, while the inactive phase, more sunlight reflectivity, positive anomalies here, builds in the Indian Ocean. Now, the GEFS model has a totally different spin on this, says, yeah, active phase in the West Pacific dying five days from now with a strong building inactive phase setting up in the West Pacific while the active phase builds in the Indian Ocean. So these two models have been dueling it out for weeks now, the net effect is neither one of them are right. And it, what's basically been happening is the MJO has just been exceedingly weak, very hard to get a handle on what it's going to do. And we can see that in the charts, even though we're supposedly in the active phase, the jet stream split and only getting worse. Um, so the MJO, for the most part, basically is having no effect on the weather. It's so weak. Yeah, it's there. Statistically, you know, with all the tools, empirically, you can find it. You can say, here's where it is. You can stick a pin in it. But it's so weak, it might as well not be there at all. Here's the upper level model, okay? Used to uh, identify where, you know, areas favorable for precipitation. Which one can interpret as the active and inactive phase of the MJO? The greens, favorable for precipitation. This runs about a week ahead. You know, the jet, you know, uh, a little bit further to the east than where it really is. That's why I say it's a week ahead. So anyway, this is where the active phase is in the upper atmosphere, we'll call it the Central Pacific, moving into Central America, moving towards the Atlantic here. What is that? March 30th, April 4th. And here's the inactive phase of the MJO coming in, taking over the Pacific starting oh, March 20th, continuing the whole way through into about the 14th of April. A little active phase forecast after that, but still very weak, sort of muddled in with the inactive phase. So no hope, and this goes out 40 days, this is out till the 24th of April, so no hope there either. Here's the one-month CFS model, all right, same deal. Here is the whole planet on one chart. Kelvin wave generation area starts here, goes to about here, so you just look straight up there. You can see where we've been, okay, well, January, we had... You know, all the reds are westerly anomalies. Here's a pretty good active phase of the MJO. That's when all our surf was happening was right here. We got into February. You can see things just start faded out, fading out. Here we are today, March, no active phase. 
I mean, it says the active phase is off in the Indian Ocean trying to leach into the Pacific, but this model also projects, well, some sort of weak inactive signal taking over. We believe that. I mean, everything sort of suggests that's the case. A little bit of westerly anomalies, but not enough. I mean, look at how weak that is as compared to what we were there. And that's what was pushing our surf back in January. Now it's just pretty much nothing. Even an active phase of the MJO, not it's a weak one, not producing any westerly anomalies. So no hope really suggested on this model either. So then we go out 90 days, okay, three months. Now this is the same deal, whole plan on one chart. Kelvin wave generation goes from there to about there, right up the chart. But this is past history there. This is the forecast here. And you go, oh my goodness, look at this. Well, that was January when we had our surf. Looks pretty good. You look here and go, wow, that looks pretty good. All right, so here's the deal though. Here is, let's see if we can do this. That So this, every day it updates. So I'm going back four days, and I'll knock this off, see if we can reverse it. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so you see there's a lot of variation from day to day in this model, just like every other model, right? So things look pretty good, or we could just do the average. Here's the average of everything right there. And that sort of, maybe that's what we should be using. We, were, we used to use that, we went to the individual members, but I'm beginning to think the average is maybe a better way to go, average of four days. And it looks like, yeah, we'll have this, it looks like an inactive phase for the next week or so, or easterly anomalies, and then back to a light westerly anomaly pattern. Let's overlay the MJO, take a look here. Okay, so here we are, inactive phase of the MJO, some sort of, a, I mean, look at these, it's, it, it's, one contour, two contours. Here was a last good one. Th one, two, three contours, active phase of the MJO. This is all just so weak. The inactive and active phases, very weak, nebulous, no real correlation. Westerly anomalies continuing while the inactive phase is in control. Basically, no indications of any significant push in the atmosphere one way or the other. And you know what that sort of smells like? It smells like the MJO is not driving anything. And if anything, the El Nino-La Nina pattern might be driving it, but we're not anywhere near an El Nino, and we're not anywhere near a La Nina either. So there's just no energy in the atmosphere. And you look at the ocean, that's exactly what it looks like and what it's been like for weeks now. Just there's nothing going on. The atmosphere's asleep. The ocean's asleep. Not a whole lot going on. All right, the low-pass filter. Even a different picture painted here or a a less uh, encouraging picture. So this, the solid contour is low pressure bias. We all know that that's been in control of the Kelvin wave generation area for two years now, something like that. So it's sort of a tendency towards El Nino, but in about by the end of March, the second contour gets very weak and we're down to one contour, which is okay, but that's just kind of neutral. There's a high pressure bias here, the dotted contour over, this is the Indian Ocean here. This is what was responsible, you see all the easterly anomalies here? That was is what is responsible, this blocking pattern for uh, the fires in Australia and the drought. And that has abated some, uh, still not completely gone. Uh, we're hoping we don't see this high pressure bias somehow migrate into the Pacific because that would be a sure sign of La Nina, but you never know. We wouldn't be surprised if it was. I mean, you just can't have this low pressure bias hanging in the Pacific forever and ever. At some point, it's going to collapse and they'll flip. And that's just part of the normal cycle. Just for laughs, here's a look at the, so this is kind of hard to read, January 2020 here. This is the strength of the MJO. You can see, yeah, we had a pretty big spike here in like January, early February. That was our swell spike. And then the MJO, this is not any indication of where the MJO is. You can see in general, it's been pretty weak. You want to see a strong MJO signal. There's some big peaks there. Uh, here's another very weak period from 2013, 2014. 2015 was El Nino, massive spikes, four standard deviations, pretty much off the chart. 2016, I think we went into like a, 
a uh, La Nina. And 2017, even weaker still. 2018 did okay. We had some eh, two, two and a half standard deviation spikes. 2019, you know, just sort of a muddling along. I mean, that was actually the biggest El Nina or the biggest active phase spike we've had in uh, two years. And that was it. So just something to keep in mind. All right. So what's going on in the ocean? Enough of the MJO. Here's the West Pacific. Here's the East Pacific. This is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino, but not up at the surface. It's the water temperature. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are the sensors, are sensors strung along those anchor lines, and they collect data and then use a little modeling software to fill in the gaps. And you can see 30 degree centigrade anomalies in the far west Pacific here. 29 degree isotherm. It's actually backtracked. I think it was back at about 173 west two weeks ago. It's back to about 176 or 177. That means warm water is retreating. The uh, 28 degree isotherm, I thought it was stuck right about 162. Kind of looks like it's trying to backtrack to 165 now. And then the 24 degree isotherm, it's still pushing the whole way into Ecuador, but it was a lot deeper. It was down around here somewhere two weeks ago. Now it's getting shallower. All right. But it's not the absolute temperatures that matter so much. It's the anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. We still see a broad area of, we'll call it two degree anomalies filling the whole, everything from, and it's really from 150 meters up that matter. Call this a Kelvin wave, but it's kind of a stationary Kelvin waves. But it ha actually, I shouldn't say that because it has moved. La two weeks ago, it was at, I thought it was about 130 west, somewhere right around here. It's moved in. It's at about one, what is that, 115 west. So it's slowly moving towards Ecuador. But Without any more active phases of the MJO, we saw none really forecast, none with any strength, which means no westerly anomalies, which means no machine to create yet more Kelvin waves, which means at some point we think all this warm water is going to collapse and then we'll move into a cool water regime. You can see a little bit of cool water right now, but that's just a pause in the Kelvin wave cycle. We still have one Kelvin wave hanging here, but there's no hope for anything behind it. Here is another model using the same data. We have, let's see, one, two, three, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So pockets of three degree anomalies, but mainly two degree anomalies centigrade. Here's that upwelling phase of the Kelvin wave cycle. So this is Kelvin wave number six, Kelvin wave number five, moving into Ecuador. This guy's slowly moving. He also, according to this, is at 110 west. So that's south of Mexico, roughly, and moving ever so slowly. Now, the other thing you want to keep your eye on is right back here. If we start seeing more uh, cool anomalies building in this area, that would be an indication that the Kelvin wave and the active phase of the MJO, that whole cycle is starting to shut down, and that would be a hint of the beginning of La Nina. So we're in what they call the spring unpredictability barrier right now. It runs from you know, March to about the end of May. All the models have a really hard time knowing what's going to happen. Some models will be saying La Nina, some will say El Nino. You know, if you have an ultra strong El Nino or La Nina, yes, you can absolutely see it in February and it'll just bull right through the unpredictability barrier. But this year, the pattern is extremely weak. So it's, we'll say it's unknown where we're going to be, at least from looking at the evidence we've looked at so far. All right, upper ocean heat anomalies, upper 300 meters of the ocean surface. This is the West Pacific here. This is the East Pacific here. We're going back a year, April 2019. What was this? Kelvin wave number four. Here's Kelvin wave number five. Here's Kelvin wave number six. It's uh, Notice last summer, two stationary Kelvin waves. There was active phases of the MJO. They produced the Kelvin wave. Warm water pushed off to the east and stalled, never made it any further than about south of California on the equator. Cool water started erupting uh, 
in the off of Peru, we thought, oh, we're moving into La Nina. But then all of a sudden, boom, the atmosphere woke up. We got a Kelvin wave, Kelvin wave number five, pushed the whole way across the Pacific into Ecuador. We've been there ever since. Here we are. It's Kelvin wave number six. It's really a combination of six. One active phase here, another active phase here. They've kind of finally merged together, slowly pushing off the warm water, pushing off to the east. We think it'll make it into Ecuador. And then we're going to keep our eye over here to see if any more Kelvin waves arrive. But based on all the data we're seeing right now, we don't think there's enough energy in the atmosphere to produce another Kelvin wave. So let's go look at the surface water temperatures, okay? Because that's what really matters. Surface water temperatures are what interact with the atmosphere. If they're warm enough, they enhance um, evaporation. Evaporation basically is a way to transmit energy up into the upper atmosphere, and that can feed the jet stream. Right now, here's Peru. Warm water, not cooking warm, but better than what it's been the past couple of weeks building off of Peru, attributable to the Kelvin waves that have been erupting. Kelvin wave number five, I believe. And we also see a pretty reasonable flow. Now, th th these two images sort of overlap. They're one and the same here. But we see a reasonable flow of warm water along the equator from almost Ecuador over the Galapagos the whole way out to the dateline. So not bad. We have this cool pool. It's kind of fragmented right now off of per off of Peru and building off to the west and the same mirror image thing happening off the U.S. West Coast. So a little tiny dribble of warm water on the equator uh, with a bigger pool of cool water north of it and south of it. So clearly this doesn't look like El Nino, but it certainly doesn't look like La Nina. It looks like we're somewhere in between the two. So what's the trend? Well, the good news is it appears there is... The temperatures are building on the equator. So this is the Nino 1 dot. They call it the 1 dot 2 region from here off to about here. And temperatures appear to be building, warming in this area, right on the equator too, which is good. The official El Nino monitoring region is from 120 west out to 170 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator. In there, and it's sort of warming there, kind of cooling there. We'd say temperatures are probably going nowhere. This is just the trend. And there's also this cooling thing going on along the uh, off of Ecuador out to the Galapagos or so. So kind of a mixed bag, kind of hard to tell. And then finally, the backed off view. Well, it kind of looks like El Nino because you have warm water building here, but not nearly warm enough. And here's those mirrored cool pools north and south of the equator. Okay, that's driven by high pressure circulates clockwise in the North Pacific. And as it pushes down along the coast, it creates upwelling. If the high is stronger than normal, it'll create this cool pool. Same deal here in the Pacific. If the high is stronger than normal, it will create upwelling and a cool pool. That's what we have. So we're kind of in this hybrid where it's the high pressure is a little bit stronger than normal, but we still have this remnants of, La Nin of El Nino hanging around. And it's like, yeah, and that's and then you look at all the other data would sort of suggest that the atmosphere is just it doesn't know what it's doing, but it's not on one extreme or the other. It's in the middle and you go, well, that's normal. Right. And it should be. But what it, where when you're in the middle, what it also suggests, though, is that there's not any push one way or the other. It's on the extremes where the jet stream revs up. I mean, if it's La Nina extreme, well, then it's just high pressure, and that's a bad extreme. And if you're in an El Nino extreme, well, then it's, you know, big surf and lots of storms and kind of out of control. So maybe you want to be 60% on the, in the extreme on the El Nino side for surf and snow, uh, but you don't want to be 60 or 70% extreme on the La Nina side because that just starts really shutting things down. So that's kind of our guess of where we're literally right now right in the middle, you know, maybe 10% either side of dead neutral. And that's what the atmosphere appears to be doing is just maybe trending, though, towards La Nina. This, th these building cool pools and the building high pressure smells like we're trending from a, a El Nino towards a La Nina. Sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region, that area right there by the Galapagos in Peru. Actually, so, with the Kelvin wave arising, temperatures have bumped up a little bit in the past 
you know, three weeks or so. Half a degree above normal, 0.491 right there. And we were actually up a little bit higher than that, up to 0.6. But, you know, two weeks is not a trend. El Nino, you have to have five consecutive months, I believe, of, of half a degree or above. We're nowhere near there. Let's go to the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region. Today, 0.525, half a degree above normal, but we've been more like you know, four-tenths of a degree above normal since January. So two and a half months, something like that. So not bad. I mean, but again, it's sort of this, we're warm, but we're not really warm. We're not warm enough. We're not in El Nino territory. We're just sort of middling, nudging warm. And that appears to not be enough to do much, to get the jet stream to respond significantly. So what does the atmosphere think we're doing? Okay, we talked subsurface temperatures. We talked surface sea, sea surface temperatures. Now we're talking the atmosphere, okay? Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. It, when pressure is lower on, in Tahiti than at Darwin, the index goes negative, and that would be like during the active phase of the MJO or during El Nino. When pressure is higher in Darwin, I mean, higher in Tahiti than in Darwin, then it's the opposite. It's like La Nina, and that's not good. All right, the daily number, very noisy, plus 4.07. So definitely indicating not in the active phase of the MJO. And you look down, yeah, we've had some negative numbers here and there. But really, on, on the balance, there was the last part of maybe the active phase of the MJO in mid-February. And now the trend has been basically positive. So we'll say inactive phase of the MJO. Another way to do that, 30-day average sort of takes the noise out of it. Minus 1.59. Okay, well, if active phase of the MJO, you're down at minus 15, minus 20. Where have we been the past month? Noodling around basically nowhere between 1 and 2. So no change for a month. The 90-day average, this is your El Nino, La Nina indicator. El Nino, it'd be down at minus 15 or so. We're at minus 2.87 today. And where have we been? It's actually up a little. So clearly no trend towards El Nino, and but not really any sort of a strong trend towards La Nina either. In fact, let's go look at these numbers sort of on a graph. Here we go. 30-day average, moving SOI average. Here we are today. Zero is dead neutral. We're one point below dead neutral, something like that. Okay, but what has the trend been? Well, this is kind of interesting. So back January 2018, we were, you know, so I'm sorry. So this is the, these low points are the active phase of the MJO, pressure dropping lower. And then these are the inactive phase of the MJO. And you can see we were sort of in a La Nina pattern, we'll say in 2018. In 2019, we move towards this weak El Nino pattern, very, you know, down, averaging, you know, minus 0.7, something like that. But now starting moving into 2020, it looks like we're moving almost to dead neutral. We would need to be up here consistently to be in La Nina territory. Nowhere near that at the moment, but definitely the trend, you can see, draw a line through it looks to be rising. So we're not going anywhere near El Nino. If anything, we're going to neutral or maybe weekly La Nina. In fact, let's go look and see what a model suggests. All right, so the official sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4, that's the official El Nino monitoring region. All right, so where this is past history. 2019, we were kind of coming out of an El, a weak El Nino, almost moved to La Nina. Temperatures started rising again in uh, the fall of 2019, but not El, uh, half a degree is the El Nino threshold. It has to be there for five months. So this winter, we kind of got there for a couple of months, but here we are in mid-March right here. We're at, we'll say, four-tenths of a degree above normal, according to this. I think in reality, that's about where we are. And the forecast is dropping temperatures down to, well, it was down to minus 1.5 two weeks ago. Now we've made some, some progress, minus 1.3, but that's clearly La Nina territory. And according to this, we should be moving into La Nina territory in June. So about a month out of the end of the spring unpredictability barrier, 
we should see, according to this model, we should be moving strongly, firmly towards La Nina. Now, a whole bunch of the other models, we looked, it hadn't updated yet. There, there's this model that sort of accumulates, there's 15 different models, sort of mashes them all together. Uh, right now, they're all saying neutral, but we're going to be very interested in what the March update shows whenever that comes out and see, uh, we'll, we'll display it here, see if it, it starts trending towards this negative line like the CFS model. Too early to know officially. So to wrap things up, the good news is there is a storm forecast developing off of Japan. Maybe one last swell relative to California. It's going to be a very long distance swell, probably not very big. Hawaii, a little bit better, very west angle. Um, so one last swell. The other good news is two southern hemi swells already in the water pushing towards California. Not so much for Hawaii. So there'll be some swell there and winds not bad this week for along the California coast to so make the most of it. Piles of snow in the mountains and more supposedly coming. Unfortunately, all the resorts are closed. Do your backcountry thing. Put on your skins. Go earn your turns. But beware. Avalanche danger is probably quite high seeing how we went for what? eight weeks or seven weeks with no snow, warm temperatures. It's probably a very slick surface, and you dump five feet of dry snow on top of that, it'll slide in a nanosecond. So uh, be very careful. Be smart. Don't do anything stupid. But do what you have to do. All right. Uh, that said, a little bit more snow on the way. Swell-wise, nothing up north. Really nothing down south either for the next week. We'll keep our eyes on it. Longer term, MJO not giving us any help. No real active phase forecast. No real inactive phase forecast either. Just kind of this dead neutral pattern. The El Nino thing, no El Nino forecast. Maybe La Nina forecast, but it's going to be yeah, another two months till we really have any clear indication, till we get out of the spring unpredictability barrier. So that's kind of where we are. If you enjoyed this forecast, great. Give us a thumbs up. You can click it right down there below this window. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. You know how to do it. Hit the subscribe button when we update the video. We'll send you in. You'll get sent an email. You'll know it's there. Of course, you can always go to stormsurf.com. That's where all the data is. You can watch this yourself day by day, week by week. Um, videos are also po posted there. All right. Thank you for watching. And we'll do this again next week. Same time, same channel.